Hello everyone, here is Mariam Shreve, a senior petroleum engineering student at the Lebanese American University. Welcome to our technical session titled Geothermal Application and the Partage Project, presented by a special guest speaker from the University of Utah, uh, Joseph Moore. Dr. Joseph Moore is a research professor at the University of Utah since the mid-1970s. His research has focused on the geology and geochemistry of geothermal systems. His work has been supported by the U.S. Department of Energy, Geothermal Exploration and Development companies such as NSF, UN, and the USAID. In recent years, Dr. Moore's attention has been directed toward the development of enhanced geothermal systems. He served as the principal investigator of the successful Raft River Idaho EGS demonstration project that demonstrated the importance of cold water injection as a tool for enhancing reservoir permeability. Finally, Dr. Moore is currently serving as the managing principal investigator of Utah's uh, Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Moore. So welcome doctor, and we are a pleasure to have you with us today. And on a final note, if you have any question related to the technical content of the presentation, please feel free to drop it down in the Q&A section and we will try to answer as many questions as possible given the time limits. And now without any further ado, Dr. Moore, the mic is yours. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the, the kind, kind words and the introduction and, and the opportunity to talk about, about geothermal energy. Um, the, the first slide shows you a geothermal plant. Uh, we'll discuss that a little bit later. Uh, but this is, uh, this is what a typical geothermal plant looks like with um, cooling towers and a turbine in, in the big green building. Uh, to give you a sense, their uh, turbines here are um, two 55 megawatt turbines, a total of 110 megawatts. And normally we think of um, one megawatt as supplying uh, enough energy for 1,000 homes. So keep that in mind uh, as we move along. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna do it here. Are we advanced? There we go. Um, so geothermal systems, uh, you know, are part of the, the renewable energy scene, uh, but they're often left out of our conversations. And, and this, is, this is really unfortunate um, because they have some benefits that other renewables uh, don't. Um, obviously, they, they have low emissions. They provide baseload power. That is, they, they are accessible 24 hours a day, 365 uh, days a year. And um, so we th often think about that, but more recently we found that uh, peaking can also be, be very useful. So peaking occurs when, when other renewables are not operating, when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. Uh, we can use geothermal to make up uh, the energy that these other renewables are not, not providing. It's uh, virtually inexhaustible and uh, obviously vast, environmentally benign, and, and it's quite low cost once, once it's established. Um, it's also an, a secure ener energy source. Uh, on the right, you can see three, three common uses of geothermal energy. The electric generation is a small geothermal plant. Um, you can see a greenhouse space heating, probably the best use of geothermal energy, and, and a spa. This particular spa is near the Great Salt Lake and the water is, is salty. It's about seawater salty. And so you can grow fish, seawater fish in it. Um, so, so geothermal uh, systems, they're found over a wide range of, of temperatures and therefore depths. Um, and, and typically we're looking at temperatures 25 degrees C to about 350 degrees C, okay? Uh, temperatures are constrained at the low end by the global uh, average gradient, 21 to 25 degrees C per kilometer. 
and by the hydrostatic boiling point at the high end. Um, oil and gas, we think of uh, pressures above hydrostatic, but, but in geothermal realm, pressures are, are hydrostatic. Somewhere the, the system uh, exits to the surface uh, is what it's telling us. Um, few geothermal wells though, are drilled greater than about three, three kilometers or 10,000 feet, just because of the, the high cost of drilling. And um, the, the fact that permeability tends to decrease uh, with increasing depth. Um, at temperatures greater than, than say 350 degrees C, the rocks start to behave plastically. Think of um, silly putty. When you were kids, you played with it. If you press on it slowly, right? It spreads out, doesn't crack, it's ductile. But if you throw it against the wall, it cracks and, and it's brittle. And, and rocks are behave the same way. So the temperatures above about 350, the rocks start to become conductile. Okay? And what I'd like to do is walk through a variety of applications uh, for heat pumps, direct use, binary plants, and then, then electric uh, generation. So at the lowest temperature, um, we, we use um, geothermal energy, we use geothermal heat pumps. You think of air conditioners in some ways. Um, the, these heat pumps don't involve geothermal water. Water is, is not part of it. Um, and they can be used for heating and cooling. Uh, so, so in the winter time, we can extract heat uh, from the ground and the summertime, we can reject heat. Here are a couple of examples. You can see a, a house, you know, and a larger scale, a, a, a hotel in Switzerland with, with many wells. So we, we have the pipes and, and we have uh, some sort of antifreeze in the pipes. The pipes can, uh, the antifreeze can reject or, or accept heat from the ground. And then we can use forced air to, to send that heat through the house. Um, the Gardner building in your lower left is, is a new building built on the University of Utah campus. It, it's quite typical of geothermal heat pump systems, uh, but, but you know, point out that it's saving 62,000 a year over a mechanical boiler system. We see over a million and a half gallons portable water per year. You know, it eliminates CO2, which, it, which we'll, we'll see is important. And there are 170 wells here to a depth of 350 feet. They're all under a soccer field now, so you'd never, never know that that was the case. Okay, so there's no water involved, involved here. Okay, so let's look at now a conventional geothermal system. And, and these, you can think of these as simple convection cells. They have three components. They have a heat source. They need water to transport the heat and they need permeable fractures for the water to move through. And on the right, you can see a permeable fracture. This is what the reservoir looks like. It's not a reservoir like a, a sand dune, you know, with porosity between the sand grains or what you might think of in a, an oil and gas system. The, these reservoirs are really fractures that constitute maybe 10% of the total volume of the rock, okay? And, and they tend to be permeable. So how does this convection system work? Well, the water initially is cold. It could be groundwater, it could be in, in Utah, it's, it turns out it's 10,000 year old water, but it's dense. It sinks along fractures and faults to some point where it heats up. And, and because it heats up, it becomes buoyant and it now rises along other structures. These are hot springs. Typical hot springs reach the surface. We drill wells into these fractures and we produce the hot water, which then can be used for, for electricity generation or for space heating. So, so it's really kind of a very simple conceptually how these work. They last for tens of thousands of years um, in natural state. And geothermal systems typically, even, even producing ones, last over a hundred years. Um, so they're long lived systems. And if we produce them right, you know, basically we're looking at forever. Um, 
Okay. The, the best use of, of geothermal energy is for space heating, much better use than for, say, um, uh, electric generation. And, and here are just a couple of examples of, of large scale space heating. Um, and you use it for, for heating and cooling, although the, the benefits are much greater for heating than for cooling. Currently, there, there are 70 countries worldwide that, that use du direct use, and, and now we're using the water itself, right? And, and so on the lower left, you see some greenhouses from, that are located in Utah. There are actually 24 acres of greenhouses. They grow poinsettias and chrysanthemums, right? Typical greenhouse complex. Uh, on the upper right, you see the Utah prison, um, and, and the prison has been using for, for more than a decade, probably closer to two, the hot water to heat 330,000 square feet of prison space. So, so huge savings in, in, in terms of, of heating. And, and finally, I threw this one in on, on the lower, lower right, just vegetable drying. It's, uh, it's a small company. It employs 24 people. In, in Guatemala, it's called Echo Fruit, and and the locals dry their 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 fruit in in this. So so kind of kind of neat, you know, of interest. But but um, you know, aquaculture is common: tilapia, trout, prawns. And prawns don't taste very good, but but um, you can also grow alligators. And there's group in uh, in Idaho that grows alligators and tilapia. Uh, obviously, two, two products that are very sellable, and it can be used for industrial processes, dehydration processes, vegetable drying, paper production. Uh, so these are, these are the best uses. And by the way, the number one country in the world in terms of direct use is China. And believe me, they need it. Um, this is, this is the poster child of direct use, Reykjavik. Probably 90% or 95% of Reykjavik is, is heated uh, by, by hot water from a geothermal plant that's pumped, I don't know, 20 kilometers away. And, and you can see these changes over time from the 1930s and 80s when fossil fuel was, was being used to today. It's, it's, it's one of the prettiest cities in the world. Um, it's clean, it's vibrant, and, and the heat works. Um, in fact, it works, works extremely well. Um, so good example of, of what can be done with, with geothermal energy. All right, let's talk about electricity now. The, the next step up, the next higher temperature. So, so direct use, say say 150 degrees, probably a good upper limit. Once you get above 150 degrees, probably generate electricity. And, and currently uh, electricity is generated in 26 countries. Uh, the very first electric generation was in 1904 in, in Lauderdale, Italy. It's still one of the largest geothermal plants in the world. And um, Prince uh, Conti lit up five light bulbs. That, that Lardarella was still going, it's still on the order of 800 100 megawatts. So big, big field. Uh, world's capacity is, is 15,000, almost 16,000 megawatts. Remember, one megawatt per thousand homes. Uh, with the top five producers being US, Indonesia, Philippines, Turkey, and Kenya. But we're now even seeing uh, Holland and, and Croatia starting to, to generate some, some electricity uh, using, using geothermal water. And, and typically these, these plants run from a few megawatts uh, to, to about 900 megawatts. This, is, this MWE is a megawatts electric, okay? And the flow rates, 40 liters per second is, is what I would call economic. This is converts to 630 gallons per minute. But, but in actuality, a, you know, a good well is gonna be 2000 gallons a minute. Okay, that's, that's the kind of flow rate. That's a lot of swimming pools in a short amount of time. So 2000 gallons a minute. And essentially from, from just uh, one to three to four fractures. 
that, that are producing that much water. So it's a lot of water, um, hot water coming out of, of geothermal wells. Okay. Most of the world's geothermal production uh, occurs around the Pacific and is associated with volcanoes. Uh, the, this association, the, you can see these volcanoes here and, and the stars are major geothermal plants, not all of them, but, but some major ones. And, um, you know, this is also known as the ring of fire because of, because of all these volcanoes. And, th and this, is, this is a consequence of plate tectonics. Uh, the volcanoes and geothermal plants occur in, in areas of subduction where, where the oceanic plates are being subducted beneath, beneath the continental plates. And as subduction occurs, the friction, the friction melts the rocks and we get volcanoes. So most, uh, most of the geothermal systems in the world are associated with stratovolcanoes and acidic volcanoes, uh, but there are some some uniquely different ones. Iceland, of course, is basaltic. Hawaii out in the middle Pacific is, is tends to be basaltic. Uh, there are others that are granitic bodies that don't, don't form typical, typical volcanoes. And then, and then there are areas like the East African rift zones. You can, you can see them. I don't know if you can see my pointer here along the African rift zone, uh, where there are a number of, of geothermal systems that are high temperature related to, to volcanic activity. Um, although I haven't mentioned this, most 99% of, of the geothermal systems that, that we have are liquid dominated. That means the fractures in the rock that form the reservoir are filled with water, okay, liquid water. Uh, and you can see on the upper right, a pressure and temperature plot for, for the water, for, for the reservoir, all right? Pressures will increase um, with, with depth, uh, and the temperatures will typically follow a uh, boiling point to depth curve. That's, that's what this, this curve is showing. There, there are a few systems that are, that are particularly interesting uh, because rather than have liquid in the fracture zones, they have vapor in the fracture zones. They have steam in the fracture zones with usually some liquid pore spaces adjacent to, to the fractures. The geysers in, in California is one. This is an example of a volcanic system with magmatic vapor chimney and in orange and, and the rest of the orange shows vapor, vapor zone uh, because of the, uh, of the low uh, density of, of steam. You know, temp uh, pressures remain relatively constant with, with depth and therefore the temperatures remain relatively constant with depth uh, through, those, through those zones. Um, the, these systems have much higher enthalpy. Steam has much higher enthalpy key content than, than liquid. And so they tend to produce a lot more electricity uh, and they're highly sought after, uh, these vapor dominated systems. They're, they're interesting because if you think about it, you basically have, you have a bathtub sitting below the groundwater table. So, so that space in the bathtub is highly under pressure relative to the groundwater regime, and it wants to flood. And it's remarkable that you can keep these systems operating for tens to hundreds of thousands of years um, with, with a vapor dominated uh, fracture zones, right? So there must be interesting seals, mineral seals that occur on the margins of these systems that, that uh, preclude the flooding uh, from occurring. Okay. Um, areas of active faulting and rifting are also areas that tend to hold geothermal systems. 
Uh, the figure on the left is a picture of the basin and range. Center of it is Nevada, but it includes parts of California, New Mexico, uh, Utah, the Great Salt Lake, Idaho, Oregon. And, and these are valleys and, and ranges with the, the basin bounding faults of steeply dipping. You can see that on the top. And, and the fluids uh, can migrate up, up these fractures. They tend to be relatively small systems, but they're quite common in many areas. And they don't tend to reach the temperatures of the, say, 200 to 300 degrees that, that you see with the volcanic, volcanic systems, but, but they tend to be important. So in the US, uh, where do we find geothermal systems? Well, we find them in the West, Maybe that's not surprising. And, and we find them uh, primarily in three tectonic regimes. Uh, we find them in the basin and range. That, that, that's these active zones of faultings. They're spreading, you know, a couple of centimeters, maybe a year. Geothermal systems are 10 to, to 100 megawatts, individual systems. The geysers, largest geothermal system in the world, um, 90 miles north of San Francisco, 835 megawatts uh, is a stable production right now. Um, and it's a vapor dominated system, right? Uh, most people don't know it exists, uh, but there it is. And, and the third um, environment is, is in the salt and trough. And, and these, um, these systems occur uh, along the San Andreas Fault uh, which separates the North American and the Pacific plate. So it's a, it's a plate, plate boundary. Um, the Salton Sea currently produces maybe 400 megawatts or so, probably could, could produce much more. Um, and, and just for, for interest, maybe, uh, the owner of the Salton Sea, which is one of the larger geothermal systems, uh, at 400, especially in the U.S., is Warren Buffett in Mid America. So, so um, Mr. Buffett is is very heavily involved in geothermal as well, um, and that's important. The other thing I want to leave you with is U.S. current installed capacity, and consider that production is about 3,700 megawatts. Remember, one megawatt per 1,000 homes. So it's not all that much, 0.4% uh, or something of our electric needs, okay? Okay, so, so you know, finding locations uh, where all three requirements, heat, permeability, and fluid exist is, is frequently challenging. Um, uh, the most obvious signs of geothermal activity are hot springs and, and uh, fumaroles, and I think I have one here. There's some fumaroles, you can see the sulfur being deposited. Um, but, but, you know, when we look at these systems, we go out and measure them, our, the maximum temperatures we'll see at the surface is 100 degrees C, boiling point temperature at the surface. And, and certainly that's not good enough. We need to know how big these systems are, what their, their volume is, what their permeability looks like, what their temperatures are at depth, if we're, if we're going to spend you know, millions of dollars to, to reduce them. So, so geochemistry and geophysics play, play huge roles in, in uh, geothermal exploitation. And um, geochemistry in particular is useful uh, because the fluids remember uh, their water rock interactions and the products of water rock interaction. So for example, it turns out we can use the sodium potassium ratio of the geothermal fluids to, to calculate the temperature at depth. The sodium potassium uh, ratio is, is, occurs from reactions between feldspars, plagioclase feldspars and potassium feldspars. And, and once these uh, feldspars react with the fluids, they lock in the ratio and it didn't change very much as they come close to the surface. So we can use that ratio and in some empirical calculations. For silica, for example, SiO2, and here we're thinking quartz and opal, um, we have laboratory experiments that, um, that allow us to calibrate the silica contents against uh, 
against temperature. And as you can see, we need to know uh, chemistry for corrosion, scaling, dilution, uh, other aspects of it. But, but geochemistry and calculation of temperatures is fundamental and dirt cheap, right? Geophysics plays a huge role as well. And, and there are a variety of geophysical techniques. There's MT, magnetotellurics, uh, and then there's the potential field methods, gravity, magnetics, and seismic reflection. The method that's most widely used is, is the magnetotelluric method, and it gets its energy from solar flares. But, but what's important about this method is it, it allows us to detect the location of electrically conductive minerals. And these are primarily the clay minerals, the, the swelling clays, the smectites, um, uh, that, that we can see their locations from the resistivity or conductivity of the rocks. Uh, on the right, we see the um, resistivities, um, what we're seeing looking at five ohm meters, you know, very, very low, uh, resistivity, very high conductivity, they're inverse. And, and you can see at 50 to 100 degrees, there, there are these red, red splotches that, that actually demarcate the clay minerals and tell us where the cap of the geothermal system is. These are actually measured temperatures from that Karha system. And so it, it gives us a sense of how deep we have to drill to get below the cap and, and produce the geothermal fluids. So geophysics is, is extremely useful. Of course, you know, you ultimately have to test the reservoir and you gotta drill some holes. And, and drilling is, is clearly going to be, be required. Drill rig on the, on the left. This is a typical big oil and gas rig, and they're doing a flow test here. But, but based on the, the temperature ranges and the, and the temperature gradients that we see, we can learn a lot about the system. In a convective uh, zone, in the production zone of a geothermal system where the fluid is convecting, right? It's, it's taking heat, bringing it up. You'll get either, you'll get a vertical line right? The temperatures will be nearly constant with depth until they hit the boiling point to depth curve, and then they'll follow that curve. So you can see, see that. That tells us that we're in a production zone. We're in a convective zone. May not have enough permeability, but at least we're in, in a potential reservoir zone. And then on the right, if the temperature simply increases with depth, that, that's conducted. That's what you expect to see outside of, of the production area. So you know you're outside the system when you start to see those kind of gradients. And of course, if you have an outflow plume, you'll get some high temperature waters um, at relatively shallow depths and then and move into a conductive regime. So we can use temperature profiles to tell us where we are. It's really critical. Okay. Um, electric uh, Electricity can be generated temperature, say, greater than about 150 C. Sorry about that. Uh, should be 150 C. Uh, this is a picture of a geothermal plant in Utah, produces 38 megawatts. A couple of interesting things here. There are 168 uh, windmills in the background. They generate 200 megawatts, or they're rated at 200, but they actually generate about 75 megawatts because they don't run all the time. The geothermal plant generates half of that, and you can see the footprint is, is a few acres versus this 10 miles or so of, of, of windmills out there. And it's hard to see, but there looks like a little lake between the first and second windmills, and, that, and that, that's a solar field, another 2,000, 200 megawatt field. Okay, but, but uh, what I want to point out too is, is there are actually two plants here. Um, there's a flash plant and there's a binary plant. The water um, that the flash plant uses is, is from a 250 degree C reservoir. The, the water is brought up in production wells. The, the steam is taken off about one third of the total flow is turned to steam and that goes through a steam plant. The remaining two thirds of the water go through a binary plant. And you can see that 
it's uh, got these little air cooling fans on top. I'm going to show you how a binary plant works because virtually all binary plants, uh, because virtually all geothermal plants being built nowadays tend to be binary plants. They have no emissions. Um, they're simple. They're small. Here's, here's a quarter megawatt uh, uh, plant on your right um, as a carrier air conditioner uh, that was turned into a, a geothermal plant. It's a great fun. It's a quarter megawatt. Okay, uh, let's look at how these work. Okay, so we have a production well. Uh, at, at the case of Roosevelt, that, uh, that fluid is coming from a production well that's also producing steam. But here we have a production well and the hot water goes into a heat exchanger. In the heat exchanger, um, heat is transferred to an organic vapor. These are all co also called the organic Rankine cycle. Uh, plants. And that, and that organic uh, vapor could be isobutane, isopentane, uh, R134, the, you know, the organic uh, fluid that you have in your refrigerators and your, your air conditioners. Okay, pretty benign stuff. Uh, so it goes through the heat exchanger where it's vaporized. Um, after being vaporized, it goes through the turbine where it expands and does work. On the back side of the turbine, we condense that, that vapor back into a liquid. That's, that's really a critical aspect of, of the efficiency of, of these plants. And it's the same thing with the steam plant. You have steam going through the turbine, you condense the steam back to water. It's the same thing with any uh, power plant, oil, gas, fired. you know, same concepts. So on the back side of that turbine, uh, we, we run cooling water or fans uh, around, around the pipes. And, and so we condense that, that steam or gas back into a liquid. As we condense it into a liquid, we decrease its volume and we create a vacuum, right? A part, at least a partial vacuum on the backside of the turbine. That, that vacuum uh, effectively pulls the organic vapor through the turbine. So there's no pumping here, uh, especially uh, these are these are almost perpetual motion, right? Uh, so so we are always pulling the vapor, we're always pulling steam through through the system by condensing it. Uh, once it's condensed, it repeats the cycle. In the meantime, the the hot water that that is used for the, the heat exchanger is then injected into an injection well and into the reservoir itself. Um, we cannot inject it into, into the groundwater. We cannot contaminate groundwater. These, these are, are physically separated by, by casing. And um, you know, there's no gas release here. Uh, and that's, that's important. Again, on the right, you can see what a heat exchanger turbine and the condenser look like for, for a very small plant. Okay. Well, you know, over the last few years, um, there's, there's been an incredibly, there's been incredibly new interest in, in geothermal development. And there have been a, a couple of, of drivers Climate change has been, been a huge driver, right? Everybody's trying to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, there are um, renewable energy portfolios that some states have, and, uh, California in particular. You know, we're going to go green. And so, so they, they need all of the green power they can get. And geothermal is, is one of them. Uh, in Europe in particular, you know, there, there's huge increases in heating and cooling costs. So geothermal can, um, can, can fill part of this. There's, there's no high temperature resources in Europe, for example, that, that produce electricity. You know, it's, it's really through space heating, like, like in China. We're seeing shortages of, of these critical Minerals, lithium, for example, rare earth elements, you know, metals. People have tried uh, to, to mine zinc. Uh, and of course, hydrogen, the new green fuel, all can be obtained from, from geothermal waters, particularly lithium. Great focus right now on extracting lithium 
uh, from, from geothermal waters. We want to, even a small scale, reduce water losses in, in boilers, for example. You know, don't have a lot of water. Well, let, let's use space heating. Let's use these geothermal heat pumps. And then, then a key driver, and this is an interesting one, is that the US DOE recently came out in 2019 and said that we um, need to increase US electric generation from 3,700 megawatts to 60,000 megawatts by 2050. That is absolutely huge, okay? In fact, DOE recognized, and anybody who thinks about it would, given the, the known uh, conventional systems, hot spring systems that, that exist, there is no way we're ever going to go from 3,700 to 60,000. You just can't do it. Maybe you go to 10,000 uh, megawatts, but you can't get to 60. You've got to do something else. And on the right, I've listed some possible approaches, and we're going to talk about one of them. So in EGS, Enhanced Geothermal Systems, I'll talk more about that. If we, can, we can stimulate low productivity geothermal wells. Get us a few megawatts. Abandoned oil and gas wells. You got tens of thousands of them, hundreds of thousands in, in Texas. We can use water from, from some of them. Uh, closed loop systems, basically take a tube, fill it with, with some fluid and conduct heat uh, from the surroundings into that fluid, pump it through your buildings. Okay, these are closed loop. They're kind of interesting, but they're conduction dominated. So they're not efficient. And then, of course, we can develop more efficient working fluids, binary plants, and we can look at drilling into magmas and Newberry in Iceland. All those are great. But, but the DOE recognized that the only way we're really going to do it is to build geothermal reservoirs where they don't exist. Okay? And, and if we look at temperatures, um, look at three and look at six kilometers, what we see is at three kilometers, we can find temperatures of 150 C, the temperature we need for geothermal energy electricity in the West. You know, you can drill to these depths fairly easily, but by the time we go to six kilometers, we can find 150 degrees across the US, all the way back to New York and, and, and New England. And, and the USGS estimated that, that even in just the West, there may be over 500,000 megawatts available in terms of temperature at, at depth. Um, and, and we think about how much we use, Jeff Tester and some of his colleagues at, at uh, MIT in 2006 uh, concluded that if we took 2% of the total amount of energy between these depths, that would be less than 2% of the energy we used in a year in the US, the total amount of energy we use, less than 2%. So there's a tremendous amount of energy stored in these rocks that is available, okay? Obviously, we can find hot rocks, but these rocks don't have permeability. So how do we make that geothermal system with the three legs? Permeability, fluid, we have to inject, and then heat. Find heat, five fluid, how do we make the permeability? This is not a new idea at all. Uh, enhanced geothermal systems, they've been, we've been thinking about them since, since the 70s. Fenton Hill, hot dry rock was the first, first example. And I'm talking about here high temperature systems where I'm hydraulically fracturing. You know, I'm pumping water into the system to open existing cracks, kind of like um, unconventional oil and gas systems, you know, frack, I don't want to use the fracking, but, but getting oil and gas out of these unconventional systems, right? We're going to pump, pump water in, stimulate it, and we're going to produce it. But we have to produce not for two years to pay back, but we need to produce for 30 years, okay? Long periods. And there have been more than a dozen of these projects worldwide over, over the last uh, 45 years. 
And the results, we've learned some things, but the results are challenging and disappointing. Um, we found that we have sub-economic flow rates. Remember 40 liters per second, 630 gallons? I want 2,000 gallons a minute. You know, 630, barely economic. is not going to do much for me. Okay. And I found out the heat recoveries. I have generate large seismic clouds, but the heat recoveries are very, very small based on tracers. And what that tells me is that the fractures in these clouds are not connected. Turns out that the, the, the flow is from you know, just a few natural fractures that existed even before any stimulation. And, and we have to control and do seismicity. You know, same thing in the oil and gas industry. Do seismicity is shut down projects and that's of concern. Well, in, in 2014, DOE initiated a Forge project and it was funded in, I think, 2017, 2018. And the project was funded to the University of Utah. Um, and so I'm going to talk about it. It's called FORD, Frontier Observatory for Research in, in Geothermal Energy. This is a $200 million project dedicated to uh, developing and testing the tools um, in, under field conditions for creating a enhanced geothermal system a uh, reservoir. We don't have to generate electricity, uh, just create the reservoir and, and develop the tools for creating and monitoring and stimulating that. And it turns out it's, it's not simple, but, but since about 2017, we've drilled six wells, uh, mostly vertical wells, five vertical, deepest to 9,500 feet, and, and one that is highly deviated. Uh, and you can see it on the, the right-hand side, deviated 65 degrees. Never been done geothermal. This is a seven-inch casing, which is bigger than, than typically used in oil and gas. Okay, um, so, so the trajectory of that, that deviated section is shown by the dashed line. This will be our injection well. Uh, next year, we'll drill a parallel well, probably above it, that will serve as the production well. We will stimulate um, this well in January, a couple of stimulations at the toe, it's entirely cased, and um, try to open up existing fractures. Um, just um, give you some idea of what we're looking at. All of these wells are hot, and you can see that, that we're in the range of 225 to 230 degrees C. So how are we gonna do this? Conceptually, we need two, two wells uh, to build an EGS system. Drill the first well. In a few months, we're going we're gonna to stimulate that well. We're going to stimulate the toe of the well. Three stimulations. John, John McClellan will be doing this. And, and so we'll be opening up those fractures. We'll be monitoring uh, the locations of the seismic clouds uh, using sensitive geophones in deep wells at reservoir depth surrounding, surrounding the, um, the injection well. And so we'll, we'll determine where that cloud is, where the cloud of, of seismicity is formed, which will then form the reservoir. The reservoir has to fall within that cloud. Um, based on the location of that cloud, we will then drill the production well, the second well, into the cloud and, and then begin to connect the two wells. Um, we'll connect them by what's called hydro shearing. The, on the lower left, you see a fracture, it's closed. Um, as we pressurize these fractures, the two sides will slip and will form wormholes with the asperities against each other, holding portions of the fracture open. And it's those wormholes that will allow fluid, fluid flow. Uh, if you're curious right now, the, the rocks, uh, uh, you know, their, their permeabilities, these are tough, hard granite permeabilities, 30 to 80 micro darcies. They effectively have no permeability. Okay? Um, even though we have yet to stimulate, which we will be doing, we've had some, some huge successes. We've, had the, we've drilled the first highly deviated dia large diameter well. 
We've demonstrated tremendous uh, success. That well, by the way, is, is 11,000 feet long, uh, true vertical depth to 8,500. We have cut drilling times by 50%. Um, here, the, the red dashed line was our predicted line for one of the wells, predicted time versus depth. Uh, we were figuring 40 days. It, it was drilled in something like half of the time in the solid red line, okay? That's massive. Um, it's important because a, a geothermal plant, the development of a geothermal plant, 50% of the cost is in drilling the wells. And if we can cut the cost of drilling by 50%, we've made significant savings in, in building geothermal reservoirs. Uh, and so we've seen that. We've been using uh, PDC bits, for those that are familiar with it, these polycrystalline diamond bits. Uh, um, and um, so these are, these are a special kind of bit that it's cutters, we're modifying the cutters. And we're using mechanical specific energy calculations to, to minimize the amount of energy used to, to drill, drill the rocks. And then this has been a game changer in terms of geothermal. And of course, this can be used in oil and gas and it could be used to, to drill geothermal conventional wells. Um, we have a data set that's available, a seismic data set, drilling data set. Anybody can, can access it. We've uh, selected and pretty much funded 50 million in R&D projects, tool development, numerical modeling, uh, thermomechanical hydraulic uh, composition modeling. We have stimulated through cased holes, something that's done routinely in the oil and gas industry, never been done geothermal industry. And we've identified technology gaps. All of the information I've discussed is freely available through the geothermal data repository. You're welcome to get it. If you can't find it, call me. And, and I'm happy to, to provide it for you. So if you're looking for a resource on geothermal, GDR is the place to go. So I thank you uh, for the opportunity to present uh, something about, about geothermal energy and obviously funding was provided by US Department of Energy and appreciate uh, our other sponsors and stakeholders. Well, thank you. Thank you, doctor, for this informative session. Uh, now for the time limit, we will try to answer only one question. Uh, so we apologize for that. Uh, the question is, uh, how do we manage the scaling of heat exchangers using these uh, solid uh, laden fluids? That's a, that's a good question. It's a, in fact, it's a great question. There, there are a couple of, um, I'm going to expand on your question. So if we're, if we're dealing with, uh, first of all, geothermal fluids outside of the Salton Sea. Uh, Salton Sea, 350,000 parts per million. But most geothermal waters, less than 10,000 parts per million. So that's less than one weight percent. Okay. And they have very low gases. Um, so, so, first of all, that, that, that's what we see. Um, in, a, in a flash plant, as the fluid comes up, it loses gases. And it loses CO2, which is the dominant gas, which causes calcite precipitation, okay? That's a no-no. So what we do is, is we inject some sort of phosphoric acid in, into the well, we drip it in there, and it inhibits crystallization of, of calcite. And if you, if, if you live out west or, or near limestones, you know what calcite does. It's just hard water deposits that form around your, your um, uh, faucet. Okay, so, so that's, that's, in the, uh, that's in the production well of a high temperature zone. In, in these binary systems, we don't allow that water to flash or to boil. So it's kept under pressure. So there is no loss of CO2 to cause that precipitation, okay? Now, there's another scale that we have to worry about, and that's silica scale. And for those uh, young ladies on the call, think of opal. That's what, that's what we're looking at, this, this nice gemstone, opal, okay? And if the temperature drops too low, 
this silica scale will form. And this is, this is actually a relatively simple thing to calculate at. What temperature will it drop? So I'm starting with a 250 degree C system like this, the system with the calcite. I get below 110 degrees C, I'm going to start precipitating silica out in my pipes and I'll never get rid of it. And so one, I don't allow silica, I don't allow temperatures drop below that, that point of 110. And what I do is I will acidify the fluid with sulfuric acid. That's really cheap. That's why I use sulfuric acid. But, but this acid um, pre precludes or, or inhibits crystallization of the silica. Okay, silica wants to deposit on cooling. And so what I'm doing is I'm precluding the, the crystallization of the, of the silica, okay? So it stays in solution. And that's both a binary plant and a, a, and a flash plant. And then as it gets back into the well, right? And into the reservoir, it starts to heat up again. And since silica becomes more soluble as I heat it, the problem goes away in the reservoir. And so those are the main issues. We do have a little problem with uh, an antimony sulfite in some binary plants, and those just have to be mechanically cleaned out once a year. But other than that, uh, it's not a problem. Uh, we, we've managed to... Um, to, to inhibit this um, kind of scaling. Other questions? Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Moore, for taking the time to speak about the application of geothermal energy. Thank you to everyone who participated and attended uh, this session. We apologize again for not answering all your questions because of the time limit. Uh, I'm happy to today. answer. If somebody wants to email me, I'm happy to, or www.forge, I'm happy to answer questions. Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome.